How's it going, Kirk? Pretty good, pretty good. Let me get my slideshow going here. Well, we're gonna we're gonna do a quick poll okay. beforehand. And, okay. Uh, okay. So I, there we go. So I wanted uh, some of you have already done the same poll because you're here in the morning, but I know we're having people come to certain um, certain presentations and not others. So I wanted to just go over uh, remind folks that and we'll do this for the re the remainder of the, the the sessions today as well. That uh, to put any comments or questions in the question bar, uh, and if you are having trouble answering these polls, please exit the full screen. So the first one is, what region of the state are you from? Uh, so we can get a sense of our audience geographically. So please take a moment to answer that. You have the results, John? There we go. So uh, it's very comparable to what we had this morning, but even a little bit more of a Baltimore Washington metro area uh, grouping. All right, the next poll, get a sense of what type of organization you're, you're uh, representing. Which of the following sectors do you represent today? State government, county or municipal, private commercial, non-governmental, non-profit, or private resident? Okay, about the same uh, percentage as we had this morning, definitely uh, heavy county or municipal government representation, which is, which is great. All right, and then the last poll before we'll turn it over to Kirk. All right, and what is your role? Uh, local planning board or commission member, local government staff, state government staff, elected official or private sector staff? And if none of them uh, fit your role, you can skip this, this question. Okay. All right. So again, good good representation locally. Uh, so thank you, John. And now I want to turn it over. Um, Kirk, I'm not. I don't think I ever got exact pronunciation of your last name. So Kirk Eb, I might be off on that. And I shared lots of emails, but I don't think I heard your last name out, out loud. Uh, so he's a GIS planner for the City of Gaithersburg Planning and Code Administration. Uh, and uh, yeah, here's again a quick reminder for the AICP credits. But we'll continue to show this uh, and uh, how to ask questions or make comments uh, in the in the question box, and we'll take time at the end of the session to, to address any questions. So, all yours, Kirk. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. I hope. Um, Kirk, can please you share. Uh, please share the screen that has the full pre the full slide on it. Okay, I'm trying to remember how to do that. I know you told me. <laughs> Under sharing. Uh huh. And then the, the drop down for screen to the far left. It says show screen. Screen is a menu. Oh, I see it. I see it. Oops. Okay, I think I've got it. Is that does that look better? You do. You got to okay. see. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, so this session is called uh, Designing for Pandemics. Um, and uh, of course, my name is Kirk Eby, as, uh, as uh, I was introduced. And thank you for getting the last name pronounced correctly. Uh, I'm going to, because we're talking about design, before we get to design, I'm actually going to give a quick overview or maybe not so quick overview about uh, disease and pandemics, because that kind of should be guiding uh, our approach, our later approach to design. Um, so let me go on to the next one, please. 
So what are communicable diseases? Because this is really what's uh, on everyone's mind these days. Um, so it's really defined as a disease that is spread from one person or animal to another uh, through one of these different uh, methods. So there can be a physical contact with an infected person. Uh, that's usually considered to be done through touch or saliva or droplets. Um, you, can contact, you can have contact with a contaminated surface or a medium. So uh, objects like countertops or dishes or door handles, uh, food, um, of course, blood and water and air. Um, and then, of course, there's also the good old insect and animal bites. Um, so things like malaria uh, and rabies, things like those are, are transmitted by animals. Um, and of course, uh, most communicable diseases are caused by microorganisms, and there's different types of them. Uh, of course, everyone's familiar with COVID-19, which is a virus, um, and that is shown there on the left. Um, there's also things like bacteria, and in the middle there is a uh, tuberculosis bacteria. Um, you can also have fungi, like the purple uh, stuff there. Uh, and there's even things that are uh, protists, which used to be called protozoans when I was uh, in, in high school. Um, and those are little kind of mini animals that kind of uh, live in the world. And an example of that is malaria, which is caused by a protist. And they're sort of categorized into different uh, types of disease. So um, if they're spread through the air, they're called airborne. If they're spread through water, they're waterborne. If they're spread through food, they're foodborne. And there's even some that are basically just kind of in the environment, and those are just kind of called environmental. Um, there's an example there of uh, blastomycosis, uh, which is caused by a fungus that uh, the spores kind of come in contact with you if you walk just through the land. Uh, it's kind of, I guess, a common thing in the eastern United States. Um, so why do planners care about communicable diseases? Well, obviously they can spread among a population and of course they can result in death. Um, and, and over the years, of course, um, planners have realized that architecture and urban design can enhance or impede the spread of that disease. Um, and of course there is a difference between just having uh, sort of the, the common cold going around town and actually having something that becomes a public health problem like what's happened with uh, COVID-19. And so how do those communicable diseases uh, transition from just a kind of a nuisance into an actual public health problem? Well, it really depends on infection rates, you know, how many people can become sick from one infected individual, um, and then how quickly it is the disease is transmitted from uh, person to person, and, and also how far it, can, it ends up spreading. Um, and then mortality rates, you know, how many people actually uh, die per fixed population. So. And that's usually talked about in terms of fixed population, so that when you talk about you know 100 deaths per 100,000 persons, that helps uh, to sort of uh, bridge the gap between an urban area where 100 deaths in a densely populated city might not be the same uh, impact as 100 deaths in a rural area that only has you know 500 people in it to begin with. So, um, and of course, the primary goal of all of this is to um, avoid an uncontrolled spread of disease. So now that we know what communicable diseases, diseases are, um, how do we stop them from spreading? Um, so really mitigating it, mitigating the, the impact and the spread of the disease, it really depends on several factors, such as the type of the microorganism. Um, and there's a little poster there sort of telling you about, um, you know, what you can do if you're dealing with a virus. And you may not want to use antibacterial stuff because it may not really have an effect on the virus. Um, and the type of transmission, so is it is it being transmitted through the air, is it being transmitted through the water, is it is it animals running around, you know, what what is causing the, the transmission? And again, choosing that effective response to make sure that you're addressing the, the, the root problem and not just throwing something at it that's not really going to help. And then planners usually focus on um, the transmission mitigation um, when we talk about design approaches. Of course, is the, the zoning setbacks that are intended to uh, allow air circulation. Um, you know, at the time that those were sort of coming out, I guess, you know, maybe there was there wasn't a 100% understanding what was happening, but the idea that the wind come, could come along and kind of uh, blow the disease away or take it away. Um, and, and then of course, public water and sewer being required in more urban areas because, um, waterborne disease is a, a big problem. And if you have septic and wells, sometimes that can, increase that likelihood of, of a waterborne disease. 
So what is a pandemic then? We've talked about communicable diseases generally, but um, you know, right now we keep talking about the COVID-19 pandemic. So what exactly is that? Um, so according to the World Health Organization, a pandemic is a worldwide spread of a new disease. So that means that it's occurring worldwide or continent-wide. Um, whereas an epidemic, which we also often hear that phrase, you know, an epidemic affects many persons at the same time, um, but it's just spreading kind of in a locality where that disease is not permanently prevalent. So it's something that's occurring in a region or a community. So of course, COVID-19 did start off as an epidemic um, in uh, probably just in China, but then it did spread to the entire world and that's when it became a pandemic. There's also a phrase called endemic, which people sometimes get mixed up with these other two, two words, um, but endemic really is talking about something that's um, specific to a particular location or region or a population. So sometimes we talk about tropical diseases like malaria, a yellow fever, things like that. And then when you're thinking about pandemics, you know, we're really caught up in the, the coronavirus pandemic, but um, these aren't something that just come, you know, every thousand years or something, you know, they are kind of recurring. Although COVID-19 is the first pandemic that's caused by coronavirus. But when you look at the flu pandemic um, over, over the last 320 years, they seem to occur, those at least seem to occur every 30 to 35 years. Um, now only one of those has really been significant, which was the 1918 uh, pandemic. Um, but still, you know, they, because they do recur all the time, it's not something that really from a design approach that you can just say, oh, well, there's really no point in addressing this because you know, it's a one-time thing and we're not going to see it again for a thousand years or something like that. It really is something that does happen often. And so I think coronavirus is probably more than the flu has made people rethink, um, you know, the longer term uh, behavioral changes that might go along with a uh, response to a pandemic. So to mitigate these airborne diseases like COVID-19 and the flu, um, one of the, the most important things that's been uh, brought to everyone's attention is social distancing. So trying to keep a, a minimum distance between each person. Uh, with COVID-19, it's the, the ideal distance is supposed to be six feet, according to the CDC. Um, and that's, you know, those distances may vary depending on different diseases. Uh, you know, it's really uh, through research and everything that you come up with, you know, how far can the disease spread and, and all that. So there could be a future disease that would have a different um, distance, but you know, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to just use the six feet that's recommended by CDC in response to coronavirus. Um, another approach would be to limit or prohibit groups uh, and indoor gatherings. So, you know, restaurants and bars and concerts, movie theaters, all these things that we're all missing out on right now. But, um, you know, it, it helps to uh, keep people apart. Uh, teleworking, of course, is a big uh, a big way to keep people, um, you know, away from each other in, in, in closed spaces. Um, and then using delivery um, instead of in-person shopping or dining or even pick up some, you know, sometimes you'll order something online and then go and pick it up, but you don't actually have to go into the store to, uh, to actually pick it up. So another approach to mitigation is air filtration and dilution. So uh, face coverings um, is probably the one that we're all familiar with. Um, and really that is a, a form of filtration and the goal is to remove or to block or to trap those microorganisms. Um, in heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, you might um, you know, improve the filtration uh, to also re remove, block, or trap microorganisms, but you may also uh, adjust the fresh air intake ratio and that would be more of a dilution kind of uh, approach, which there the goal is just to, to reduce the risk of transmission by reducing the number of microorganisms in a given volume of air. And that's really what outdoor seating, outdoor sales, outdoor fitness, all of those outdoor activities are really doing as well, is trying to, uh, to, to take advantage of this, this uh, reduction in the number of microorganisms in a given volume of air, as well as trying to take advantage of the outside air uh, being in move, being constantly in movement and, and moving things around and taking things away. And lastly, of course, we have uh, perhaps the most effective of the, all of these, which is the chemical and ultraviolet treatment, mostly the chemical treatment, um, you know, where the goal is to actually kill the microorganism. And um, this is a lot more difficult to implement as, you know, planners and, <laughs> and planning commissioners. Um, we did see images in China where, uh, you know, whole cities were being sprayed down with disinfectant and things like that. And hopefully it won't come to that 
here. Um, but really from design, I'm not sure exactly what you would do to design for that unless you were gonna somehow put in built-in uh, spray nozzle somewhere around the streets or something, but that that just seems a little far-fetched and expensive anyway. Um, so for imp implication for actual design strategies that you could uh, use to approach uh, combating these communicable diseases. So if you think about social distancing and trying to keep the six foot distance between people uh, for in-person activities, um, when you think about sidewalks and paths, um, you know, if a sidewalk was already six feet wide, um, that would sort of help you understand visually, you know, where you should be in relation to other people. So there's something there, I think, just from from that aspect that sort of says that, you know, rethinking the width of sidewalks and maybe saying six feet should be a new minimum, that, that might not be a bad approach. Um, and having bike lanes, uh, you know, where you're on each side of the road versus the cycle tracks where both bike, you know, uh, travel lanes are next to each other. Um, by having lanes that are on opposite sides of the street, that you know creates more distance between the, the bike riders and everything. Versus cycle tracks, where you know depending on how close you are, you might actually need you may not have be six feet from the other bicyclist coming the other way. So there may be some need for you know uh, wearing face masks or even putting up some sort of plexiglass barriers between them, um, or just rethinking whether you know bike lanes have more advantages over the cycle tracks. And if you think about entrances into uh, buildings, um, you know, there may be a need to have larger vestibules so that people can uh, enter the building without uh, being in a, a big crowd. Um, and maybe sidewalk areas uh, where people can line up to, to go into a building. Um, we've all sort of probably experienced that. Um, for delivery, you might need more short-term parking for the delivery vehicles. You may need to actually take some spaces and turn them into uh, that kind of uh, delivery short-term parking or, or pickup. You know, you might need to convert some of your longer-term spaces into short-term parking uh, so you can pick up uh, our online and, and phone orders. And then for teleworking, um, there's a lot of stuff that's planning related, but not exactly under the purview of planners and planning commissioners. But one of them is infrastructure, you know, the internet itself. Um, and it's sort of both landline and wireless or Wi-Fi kind of approaches. Um, some of that comes into play whenever, you know, we're, we're doing things like even cell towers and things like that. You know, a lot of people are not necessarily using the more traditional uh, internet connections, but a lot of people are using cellular internet connections or, and data. So those do come into play in some in some level at the planning commission uh, side, um, and of course teleworking can reduce can result in reduced traffic, uh, which may lower pollution from cars and other vehicles. Um, it may also mean that maybe you need fewer roads over time. If if teleworking isn't just a one-time thing that only happens during a pandemic and actually continues after a pandemic to some extent, um, and then of course as I mentioned earlier, pandemics aren't something that you know, only occur every 500 years or a thousand years or something like that. These are some, you know, the flu pandemic seems to occur uh, much more often. Um, and even weather incidents, I didn't put that up here, but, you know, when you think about snow days and things like that, um, teleworking may allow a lot of that um, to not, you know, to, to still function, even though there's three feet of snow outside, or even though there's a lot of people that are sick with the flu. Um, and all of that may mean if people are traveling less on average, you know, not necessarily, you know, day by day, but over time, if, if it does result in, in less traffic, you might actually need fewer roads or maybe even less transit right, and a reduced parking demand. So you may be, you know, able to have less parking in your regulations or, or require less parking as part of certain land uses. Um, and then, of course, another another side effect, if you if telework really does uh, stick around for a while and become a lot more prevalent, where you only have to be in the office one or two days a week, um, it means you can almost live anywhere. And for all we know, that's going to you know lead to more sprawl and more segregation of uses and more decentralization, which is sort of the opposite of where things seem to be going before all of this was was happening. You know, it seemed like everybody was trying to move more towards, uh, you know centralizing and urbanizing and trying to have less sprawl and um, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out long term um, so for design strategies themselves when you think about air filtration um, and you think about you know your air circulating through your building um, 
there's a lot of approaches that you might start to think about, like whether you should separate private areas from common areas. So when you think about an apartment building, when you enter in the lobby, and there's a lot of common areas like the hallways uh, where you get your mail, things like that, you know, that air circulation could in theory be separated from the air circulation that's, you know, for each apartment unit. Um, it probably would be a lot more expensive than what's done now, um, but that's something that, you know, that's one approach that could be done. Um, and the same thing would apply, obviously, to offices and labs and research and development. And, and in fact, with those commercial uses, it may be more of a tenant by tenant thing where, you know, maybe the goal would be to try and separate each tenant's uh, air circulation from each other, from another tenant's. Um, and then, of course, outdoor seating with sidewalks and removal of parking. Those are some other approaches that um, would help with um, air circulation, air filtration. And ultraviolet treatment. Um, would be a little bit tricky to do from a design standpoint, but you know there was a time when these the idea of solar glass walls and sometimes you'd have you know some water uh, things behind there to heat up and give off heat in the night and things like that. But it's an interesting idea to to look at that. Although of course the problem is most uh, glass that you use in buildings these days actually has ultraviolet blocking because you don't want it to you don't want that light coming in to fade your paint and your your uh, other services. So that's something that you know might have to change if you're really going to try to take advantage of some sort of ultraviolet uh, treatment in a, in, within a glass wall or a, a, a solar room or a sunroom or something like that. And in terms of planning commissioners, you know this is an area, especially the outdoor seating, where you might see a lot of uh, new requests for that type of, of uh, conversion of parking lots or parking spaces on on the street into outdoor seating. So the commissioners really um, should be kind of open-minded about that and and also open-minded about what else goes along with outdoor seating. Um, you know, you might need some heaters, you might need temporary fencing, you might need some sort of signage. It's always good to think those things through um, and think about how there are other parts of your zoning ordinance or your regulations that might also need to be um, thought about or even amended or changed in order to allow some of these types of, of uh, outdoor uses. And again, with apartment buildings, you know, we talked a little bit about um, separating the air circulation, but even with the entrances, you know, there's um, apartment buildings that have kind of open entrances where people can just walk through. And that also obviously allows the air to circulate through uh, those entrance areas. Um, but of course, that also creates some security concerns um, and privacy concerns because, you know, anybody can just kind of walk through there. But if you enclose it, then you get back to the, the, the concern about you know, air circulation not being separated. Um, I know out west in uh, San Diego, they have, uh, and other places in California, they have some sort of hybrid of this where it is open, it, it is kind of an open air thing, but they'll put a, a, a gate or something, an open gate on it so that it provides some security and privacy, but still allows the air to circulate through. So that might be something you know, to look into uh, more. Um, and within the unit itself, each apartment unit, um, you know, there's sort of this increased demand for uh, some sort of space when you first enter the unit so that you can put some stuff down, take off your shoes, kind of separate the outside stuff from the from your the rest of your unit so that you can kind of contain whatever was you're bringing in from the outside in that one particular part of your uh, apartment. Um, and then for private outdoor space for apartments, um, you know, balconies, patios, uh, rooftop decks, those are all sorts of ideas that they're not nothing new. Um, but the question is, should those become more um, prevalent? You know, and as planning commissioners, of course, these are the questions that you might ask when you're reviewing uh, a architecture for a, a, a new apartment building that's being proposed. You know, you might ask, oh, well, I see you've put some Juliet-type uh, balconies up there, but could you, you know, maybe expand those a little bit more so that it could actually be more usable space where someone could put a chair out there and and actually sit outside and have some outdoor space that they may not actually get somewhere else. Um, and then I already talked about the air circulation, but you know, with dens and lofts and walk-in closets, you know, can those are those going to be more common or more in demand um, so that you can have home office space? And some of that might have to, you know, a little bit to do with whether teleworking sticks around or not, but some of it might just be that people have realized that they really like to have that extra space to have uh, another uh, home office or something else like that, even if it's not related to uh, teleworking. Um, and again, back to the planning commissioners on on the idea of these these dens and walking closets and lofts. I mean, one of the things that the commissioners might do um, as part of the review is to ask, you know, well, how many units have 
dens and how many units are have a little bit extra space or a little nook or something where this kind of a home office could happen and you know are these the the micro units or the the micro studio apartments are those really still a viable thing and will or is it again is this a temporary uh thing or will this you know will will that come back in the future once the pandemic has ended so when you think about commercial buildings um same thing vestibules covered entrances and arcades are some some ways to um, allow air circulation and also provide some sort of protection from the elements um, you know outdoor employee space uh, where employees can eat or exercise or socialize or collaborate from a distance those are probably something that's going to become uh, you know certainly during the pandemic is some more on people's minds but even afterwards I know uh, I remember uh, when I was in architecture school that we were we heard a statistic that people spend about 90% of their lives inside a building um, and maybe we'd all like to spend a little more time outdoors anyway, and maybe something that's come out of this whole pandemic is um, the realization that we should be spending a little more time outdoors. So, you know, I don't know that the demand for uh, outdoor employee space will really go down after um, this. And the same thing with uh, covered entrances and arcades for commercial uh, properties where people would rather be outdoors instead of indoors. Um, and the same thing with restaurants, outdoor seating, you know, um, and of course, outdoor seating, all these things have some challenges with inclement weather. Um, you'll see there the one outdoor seating example that has some of those um, those outdoor heaters to try and uh, mitigate that, that inclement weather uh, aspect, at least part of it, at least the cold part. Um, and again, the arcades and covered entrances, things like that, well, the arcades at least could be used as outdoor seating where you also have some uh, amount of shelter from uh, the elements. So design implementation challenges. So once you've figured out you've, you know, your design approaches, there are, of course, going to be some challenges associated with that. So we talk about infrastructure, you know, sidewalks and paths and on-street parking conversion. Well, if you're converting, if you're expanding sidewalks or expanding paths and taking away some parking, um, then the question becomes, is there still enough parking for the uses that are there? Or is there a way to maybe re reconfigure the parking? Like if you have a 90 degree parking, can you change that to parallel parking to keep some of the parking spaces, but then uh, use some of the space for other things like sidewalks and paths? Um, and of course, you know, the whole the whole wireless networks and, um, you know, even landline networks for teleworking and delivery, um, you know, the question was comes up not only, you know, where do those go, but, you know, is it private, is it public? Um, and of course, that brings us to cost. You know, who, sh who should pay for some of these design changes? Is this really a private in uh, market response or should the government really be kind of backing some of this? Um, and um, the same thing with the outdoor employee space. You know, is that something that, um, you know, private should be left to the private sector or should the government kind of intervene and maybe have, you know, as part of plan review or as part of, um, you know, some grants or incentives to try and, and, and see, and, Get some more of that space built um, and then of course you know approvals and time and delays for all this stuff you know how long does it take you to get a permit for a new outdoor seating area um, and then you know how long will it take you to get a planning commission approval to change your site plan to take away 10 parking spaces that now you're going to be actually not meeting the the parking uh, ordinance requirements and so now you need a waiver and all those types of things and you know, for planning commissioners, I think a lot of your role really would be to try to minimize those delays. Obviously, work with your staff to, on these types of things, um, and then you know, perhaps to make some recommendations for public investments where appropriate or, and when appropriate. And of course, the other design challenges. You know, what what do, what do we all do when this pandemic ends? <laughs> you know, I think a lot of the things that are that are out there that people are promoting. It's really about flexibility, you know, that that's really the key to these to a successful design approach, um, so that it can be used during and uh, after uh, a pandemic. So it's not just a one-time thing that you're just putting out there and then maybe throwing everything in the trash when you're done. Um, and then what about climate change? You know, is there a way that some of these um, responses to the pandemic could address multiple global challenges? So. When you think about using renewable materials, uh, when you think about trying to uh, pick pick uh, furniture that can be reused for other things, um, or if it's the kind of furniture that can, you can have indoors or outdoors, so it can be moved both places. Um, 
And then again, the role of planning commissioners really is to you know consider incorporating this flexibility um, and some sort of climate change considerations into development reviews and perhaps even conditions of approval. Um, and so general design strategies would be again with this whole idea of flexibility, you know, don't don't design in a vacuum, always think about what's around you um, and avoiding that design that would only be for our a specific crisis or within sort of a constrained time period that really wouldn't be applicable after things change or go, go back to somewhat to normal. Um, so again, flexibility, multiple applicability are key. Um, you know, picnic tables that can double as artwork that's, or it can be used later in parks. You know, that's, that's one approach. Um, and Again, the idea of having furniture that could be that's more durable, that can be re reused or repurposed or sold and still used afterwards, rather than ending up in a landfill or ending up as firewood or something like that, obviously would be good for the, the environment. Um, so sidewalk design specifically, um, you know, sidewalks are really used um, by pedestrians, but they are also often serve other purposes. So you know, they can be, be used for outdoor seating and furniture. Um, bus shelters, outdoor dining areas, um, some sort of greenery like trees and stormwater management, grass, um, things like that. Vendors often use sidewalks, so food trucks and newsstands, things like that. Um, you know, in the more urban areas, you often see these micro mobility stations for scooters or bikes. Um, and then, of course, they can also there also can be some safety and defense, um, like with bollards and fences, um, and just lighting in general. And of course, traffic controls and things like that. And really, sidewalk design should kind of reflect the surrounding community's typology. You know, is it an urban typology? Is it suburban? Is it residential? Is it commercial? Is it mixed use? And at the same time, in addition to reflecting that that surrounding area, it should also make sure it's that it's meeting the community's needs for you know what what do they need with for the sidewalk? How are they going to use the sidewalk? Um, and sidewalks could also be leveraged to implement, you know, a theme or a vision for a particular area. So you could use unique paving materials and patterns. You could have some sort of exclusive furniture or artwork um, to kind of reinforce that uh, sense of place and that uniqueness. And the action, when you get down into the technical side of things, you know, the actual width of, of, of sidewalks, it really depends on a lot of factors. Some of it's the things we just talked about, you know, what what is a sidewalk going to be used for? So, and also the typology, you know, where is a sidewalk located? Um, and there's a difference between, um, you know, a sidewalk that's used for connection and a sidewalk that's really trying to do one of these multi-use things that we were talking about. Um, in terms of connection, you know, if it's just connecting through a neighborhood, a residential neighborhood, as I mentioned earlier, you know, six feet might be a better sort of minimum width because that will give people a visual cue about you know where they should be in relation to other people if there's something, some sort of pandemic going around or even just if it's flu season or something like that. Um, some of the other things that come into play when you're talking about how wide sidewalks need to be, you know, how many people are using it? You know, the more people who use it, the more the wider it probably needs to be. Um, and then of course the space needed for other functions that we talked about. Um, and also space for other things like utilities and public signs and traffic control. And then the placemaking considerations we talked about, you know, having unique patterns, having some sort of uh, different and unique uh, amenities that sort of speak to where you are in, this, in, in your local town. And then when we're talking about uh, multi-use paths. Um, it's, these are similar to sidewalks, but the difference is that it's not just pedestrians using these paths, it's also bicycles. So. Usually they need to be a little bit wider just because um, you, you know you, you would expect to have uh, the lower speed pedestrians and the higher speed uh, bicyclists next to each other. So you may want to provide a little more room just so the, that the higher speed bicyclists have a little more uh, wiggle room to get around the slower moving pedestrians at the very least. Um, and with, with multi-use paths, normally the signs and furniture and things like that are off to the side of the path rather than kind of integrated into the sidewalk, which you would, you know, as, as would be done with a sidewalk. Um, and sometimes there's pavement markings, um, there can be mile markers and things like that to assist with, you know, if someone has a, an issue and calls 911, make sure that people can get there quicker. Um, and really these can be on street or off street. They're typically off street, but um, the on street versions are starting to become a little more uh, 
you know, common. Um, there's an example there of one that's under construction and you'll see that it shows both in the middle there, it shows both a pedestrian and bicycle symbol on there. Uh, here in Montgomery County, uh, there was one that was recently completed on Veers Mill Road where it extended a path that comes down from uh, the Twinbrook Metro Station area and connects to the Rock Creek Trail. So the path that was put on the shoulder of Veers Mill Road there um, is used by both pedestrians and bicycles. Um, and in terms of the, the role of planning commissioners on, on the multi-use path design, um, you know, you really need to, to provide kind of a balance of design that can accommodate all the users of the path. So you're, you're not just focused on bicyclists or pedestrians, you're kind of thinking about everybody and how to accommodate everybody and, and also, of course, safety and all of those things. Um, so thinking again back, you know, down to the, the sort of technical details of things, um, you know, for pedestrians, typically a pedestrian footprint, in other words, how much space you take up on the ground, it's about a foot and a half in width, give or take, you know, on average. So if you have two pedestrians, that's already three feet of width. Um, if you think about how you want to have six feet of social distancing, that gives you nine feet. But because pedestrians can easily walk on grass or dirt or anything like that, um, a paved width of six feet is probably okay, kind of like what we talked about with the sidewalk. But six feet is probably not wide enough when you start talking about bicyclists. So we start talking about bicycles, you know, the footprint is usually around three feet in width. And of course that includes, you know, the handlebars and your, your pedals sticking out. Plus you wanna have a little room to, to move, maneuver in there. Um, so if two bikes then become six feet in width, then you need the six feet for social distancing. Then you need 12 feet of width. And, and really, you know, with bicycles, you know, it's cert you certainly can ride on grass and dirt, but you'd probably rather not, especially if you're moving a, at a good clip there. So it's better to think about, you know, the entire pavement width being to be that 12 feet. So here in Gaithersburg, um, we have a lot of these uh, multi-use paths and uh, most of them range in width from eight feet to 10 feet. So they're actually not quite the 12 feet that, you know, maybe this pandemic is kind of telling us we need to start thinking about. Um, and of course, if you're talking about higher speeds for bikes, then you might need even more width. And again, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, the, the sharing of higher speed bicyclists with uh, lower speed pedestrians, that also, you know, creates a little more width there. I mean, these are really just minimums. You know, if you, you know, and it just, another thing that would require more width is if you have a lot of volume, if you have a lot of people using these paths. Because, um, you know, if you have two bicyclists coming towards each other in the opposite direction and you have a pedestrian there, now all of a sudden you need more room for everybody to be able to get by. Even without social distancing, you would still need more room for people to be able to, to safely pass each other. And so for the role of planning commissioners, you know, you really should consider um, not just the current needs, but also future needs. And, you know, don't, you know, sort of get shoehorned into the thinking about how we live in a pandemic, <laughs> but also think about um, utilization, future population growth, um, you know, possible future expansion, how easy that would be, and if there's even going to be a need for it, things like that when you're looking at it, um, when you're looking at approvals for these types of things or suggesting where they should go, those are always uh, good to keep in the back of your mind. So I'm just about done with my presentation here. Um, there are a few resources I found out there. Um, so Baltimore City, they did a whole design for distancing um, sort of uh, contest, I guess you would call it. And uh, they have a lot of very interesting ideas um, in that, in their little book that they put together. Uh, there was also a New Yorker article that talked about um, architectural design responses to the pandemic. Um, that's also a very interesting read. And um, in terms of converting you know, parking to other uses. Um, there was this one article from Axios that talked about parking garages. You know, if you don't really need the parking that they, some parts of them might actually be converted to residential uses, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, kind of a little bit different from what we normally are thinking of with the pandemic. Um, and then there was another uh, article from San Francisco where I guess some of these uh, parking spaces were being rented out to be used as outdoor office spaces. So I thought that was another interesting thing. You know, a lot of times you think of San Francisco, you think of their little parklet thing where they take a parking space and turn it into a park. But I thought this was interesting that, you know, turning a parking space into uh, an actual uh, office workspace, you know, teleworking space. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, there's a pretty good uh, uh, overview of sidewalk design from uh, the uh, Federal Highway Administration and um, that link. 
And for multi-use paths, um, both Massachusetts and uh, Washington State have put together some pretty interesting uh, manuals for designing multi-use paths. And if you really wanted to dig down into the pandemics themselves and, and, and look into those, there are a couple of links there that talk a little bit more about how often those pandemics occur, the frequency. And so I guess I'm ready to wrap up and uh, have everyone uh, ask some questions of me if they'd like to. Um, and my contact is up there if you have any questions of me. So, and if no one has any questions, I have a few questions to get a conversation going, hopefully among all of you. So I'll turn it back over to uh, whoever. Thank, thank you, Kirk. We, we don't have many questions yet, but feel free to please send them in. We, we do have 18 minutes left, but I'd also love to hear yours as well. I do have one though here for you. Um, you, I mean, you talked a lot about parking requirements uh, there throughout. So do you see this as an opportunity for infill or Main Street development that may have previously been hindered by high parking requirements? Um, and and I think when you were first talking about it, you're talking about parking requirements in relation to maybe office or employment use. What about residential parking requirements uh, in the same kind of environment? Um, so question for you. Yeah, I, th I think it's, you know, generally, I think it's not a bad time to kind of look at your parking regulations generally and your and your requirements. Um, you know, here in Gaithersburg, a few years ago, we did look at our parking regulations, um, which were sort of uh, probably written back in the 1970s and maybe hadn't really been, you know, thoughtfully looked at since then. And we did make some changes to, to sort of recognize um, how things have changed and maybe there is a little bit less parking demand. Um, we looked at, for example, our uh, our shared use uh, parking chart, which allows a reduction in amount of parking you need based based on different shared uses. And we realized there were some, you know, a few uses that maybe were missing there. I think religious use was one of those ones that we thought, well, maybe that needs to be added in there because it's probably a lot less demand for that during the weekday than on the weekend. Uh, versus office, which obviously would have a higher demand weekdays um, than on uh, weekends. But in the in the bigger scheme of things, you know, if if teleworking is going to kind of stick around uh, for a while, um, or if you think that it's going to stick around for a while, that's one of the, the areas to look at. Um, you know, can the amount of parking needed for office space, you know, be reduced? Um, and in terms of residential, you know, if people are, um, you know, taking more advantage of micro mobility type uses or using transit more and not driving as much. Kind of outside of the pandemic uh, context of things, um, that's just something you, you could certainly look at just to see how people are using them. Um, there are other places that you know take a different approach depending on on you know the that typology I was talking about. So um, some places that have um, you know sort of a downtown area might decide for the downtown area to not even require any parking or to even prohibit building parking to to force people to basically walk or use public parking garages or, or figure out or take transit or do something else. Um, you know, sometimes those are successful if it's a very successful sort of commercial district um, or mixed use district, but um, certainly something to be, you know, used with caution, I think. But de definitely, um, you know, looking at your parking uh, ordinance and looking for things that maybe are overparked is something that definitely is a good opportunity to look at. Um, and while you're doing that, you could also look at, um, you know, it doesn't make sense to have different parking requirements for different times of the week, you know, so maybe on the weekend, parking spaces, you could just write it in that parking spaces could be changed over to um, outdoor space or temporary outdoor uses or something like that without having to you know, necessarily go through a, a planning review process or something like that. If if the demand isn't really there on the weekend for those spaces, then it's just sort of sitting idle there on the weekend. So, okay. Are there any, are there any uh, yeah, other questions? We've got a couple. Yeah, we got a couple. Two more. Two other ones here. Make sure. Yeah. All right. Has there been any? Have there been any issues about while COVID and outdoor related to COVID and outdoor seating were insect related issues relating to food and drink and the unhealthy issues that may result from being outside. So um, yeah, I guess you've heard any issues of that about, you know, um, I have not vectors. Right. I, I have not heard anything about that, although I can imagine, um, you know, anecdotally, my personal experience, sure, if I'm outdoors, mm -hmm. I don't like when bees and wasps come around me because I'm kind of allergic to those. But um, 
I think there's ways to probably mitigate some of that. You know, um, there probably are some, you know, citronella or <laughs> or those bug zappers that could be used to try and reduce the amount of insects out there. Um, but certainly, I think that's something that probably needs further study. I mean, that's a that's a great comment. You know, to there, there's all these other factors that again we don't necessarily think of when we're thinking about as planners anyway, or, or planning commissioners when we're thinking about outdoor seating and and what it needs. I mean, you know, not all outdoor seating is covered either. That's another another thing. Or if it's covered, it might just be uh, one of those little umbrella things. And in terms of you know, trying to keep the elements out that may not be the best approach, at least long term. So that's another thing that probably could be looked at. Um, and I guess another one to look at in terms of insects and things like that would be, you know, could you do outdoor seating, but have it kind of screened in to try and keep the insects on one side or the other? Um, and would, but would that still allow enough air circulation, that kind of thing? So very good question, though. Got a couple more here. Um, do you see that both the pandemic and climate issues will create a need for not only parking requirements, but also sidewalk requirements, which can be an afterthought in the suburban or rural environment, both of which are car focused? So kind of building on that parking discussion. Right. Um, yeah. And again, I think this comes back to kind of my my comment about whether the pandemic and the way we're thinking right now, whether that type of of thinking is going to continue after the pandemic ends. You know, are we going to still think about these things and and think, well, you know, just because the COVID-19 pandemic is over now, um, you know, there's another flu pandemic could happen any second now. We still need to be thinking about social distancing. We still need to think of, be thinking about giving people the option of eating outside. Um, and then I, even what I said earlier about how um, you know if we really are spending about 90% of our lives inside a building in the United States, maybe we all should think about trying to get out more anyway, and maybe that's one way we can be outside more often um, is, you know, throughout outdoor seating. Um, so I think, you know, I think part of it depends on whether um, whether we're going to continue in this thought, this, this thought mode of the pandemic, you know, and how long that will continue. Um, personally, I think the world has changed a little bit, but at some point, I think you know, as as time goes on, we might start to to forget about these things and wonder, well, why did they ever change those parking spaces to outdoor seating? That was a mistake, and now we have no place to park our cars. You know, it's interesting. Things kind of come and go in cycles, but I think um, in terms of planning commissioners, you know, this and and planning staff, even, you know, this would be a good time to, to again really take a hard look at your your ordinances and and decide whether there are long term things that should happen, even if um, you know the pandemic you know, isn't on people's minds and, and people aren't thinking about that, you know, what other thing, what other benefits do things like outdoor seating bring? Um, you know, do they create more activity on the street? Um, do they create an opportunity to create more green space? Um, because um, rather than, you know, with parking, you really have to pave over everything. But with outdoor seating, you may be able to, um, you know, convert the parking and also recapture some green space. So there might be some other benefits to it. So I think that's kind of, another way to approach it and now getting back to that that idea of you know climate change and trying to improve uh, uh the global environment and everything certainly adding some green space would would go uh some some distance towards that um you know maybe not the same as stopping uh you know rainforest clearing but you know i think we always are thinking as planners and planning commissioners i would think too um we're always trying to do our little small part to, to improve things and, and do our little part for climate change and for, um, you know, long-term viability of our of our town and city. So that's kind of what I, my thoughts on it. Okay. And we got a, even a few more questions now. People are, you got people thinking, I got the, the questions out. Do you have any suggestions on how mixed uses may be modified or adjusted as a result of the pandemic? Any suggestions on how mixed uses can be even more flexible, pandemic or after, pandemic and after. Wow, well, that's a that's a great question. You know, here in Gaithersburg at this point in time, we're actually doing a, a, a master plan for the Lake Forest Mall area. And that's something that's definitely come up about mixed use. You know, there are there's sort of talk of, of um, looking at other mixed use developments and thinking about what does mixed use mean, uh, you know, in this, in this day and age. You know, is it really just limited to, you know, retail with some residential apartments above? Is it just, or is it limited to kind of a little mix of retail and a handful of commercial offices, like little medical offices, and then some 
apartments above? Or is it is it something more than that? You know, is there a way to get more types of, of mixed uses in there, um, like lab space or research and development space, um, incubator space? That was that was a big one that a lot of people talked about. You know, is there a way to have and is there a way to have some sort of flexible public space that could be used for for different things you know and i think that's very true and whether that that flexible public space is an outdoor space or an indoor space or maybe both i think those are definitely things that need to be looked at and interestingly enough i think there has been um sort of the outdoor uh, public space has always always sort of been part of the mixed use uh dialogue although maybe not as depending on who's doing it you know it could be the focus of it or it could just be sort of a you know, it's it's interspersed in there, not really the focus of it. But I think there there's definitely some opportunities to look at all of that. Um, and again, with the whole idea of, you know, you're talking about sidewalks and and um, multi-use paths and having flexibility. I mean, that really applies to everything. And having flexibility and mixed use is definitely something that's probably beneficial. Um, you know, being able to reuse a space that, you know is currently used for retail and, and being able to turn that into some sort of little uh, maker space, you know, whether it's a, a you know, a little a brewery or a place that 3D prints uh, little parts that are used for, you know, bicycles or something, I don't know. Um, you know, so, you know, just different ideas that you don't really see in these types of, uh, of mixed use developments now, but certainly it could happen. Um, you know, and I didn't really talk too much about retail, but you know, there's certainly an idea that retail may have, you know, may be changing, um, and even restaurants may be changing to some degree, where um, it's it's more about delivery and pickup and online ordering, and less about the physical space. So there may be less demand for that. And even with offices, you know, if you have more teleworking, you might need less office space. So really, what you know, what does mixed use mean? Should it mean more? Um, you know, more of these flexible uses and, and maybe even more experiential uses, you know, like a bowling alley or a, a ice skating park or rink or whatever, you know, stuff, stuff like that might be more uh, of the kinds of uses you need to see in a mixed use um, rather than the sort of traditional, again, you know, retail with a handful of office and just residential apartments. And even the residential side of things, you know, apartments may, th there's still certainly a good, a good, um, type of dwelling unit but you know there might be some other uh, innovative types of things out there you know um <clears throat> thinking back to the days of le corbusier who did his uh one apartment building where you know it was really each apartment was two stories tall and then the elevators only stopped every other floor and all these other weird things that were going on but just the idea that you had a whole different feel for those apartments because it wasn't just you know one story flat it was really designed to be this two-story thing and there are certain things or certain residential types that you know we don't see as as much as we maybe should be seeing um you know sometimes they're called the missing middle things like two over two condos um triplexes quadplexes things like that um you know all these different different approaches to residential that you know could could bring a lot more variety to the to the architectural facade as well and, and to the the streetscape you know instead of just you know your straight traditional apartment buildings i think we have time for probably two more questions um i'm going to skip over one to come back to it just because this question relates to that discussion about sidewalks some localities require sidewalks on only one side of the road in residential areas thoughts i guess your thoughts on requiring sidewalks on both sides of the road to allow for social distance yeah, that's a great comment. I I didn't really talk about that in my uh, my presentation, although I probably should have. Um, and actually, the neighborhood I live in, in Rockville, we most of the streets only have sidewalks on one side in in, in my little section. And um, you know, before <laughs> before the pandemic, it was just kind of annoying that oh, I have to cross the street to go walk on the sidewalk and all of that. But you know, now with this, it really becomes more of a critical thing because if, if there are people walking on the sidewalk on the other side, then, you know, you'll either have to, you know, walk out in the street or walk on the other side. So certainly I think that's an, uh, a really good reason to to rethink whether sidewalks on only one side of a street make any sense, you know. Um, there may be some cases where it, it still makes some sense, you know, um, if there's, but it, it, it's hard to say, you know, if you have a park on one side and houses on the other, there's always this this idea that well you don't really need a sidewalk next to the park because it's a park and all of this but 
at the same time, I mean, it's a good point that if, if people are walking and you need to social distance, you may not be able to. Um, and again, back to the idea of, you know, if you're going to crack open your zoning ordinance or your regulations to talk about, you know, you know, where sidewalks should be located, you know, should they be on both sides of the street, et cetera, you might as well look at how wide should they be, you know, is, is if you only require them to be three feet wide or four feet wide, is that really, um, does that still make sense? Or should you require them to be wider? Um, if, you know, the right of way permits, I mean, that's a whole other discussion too about, you know, if there's not room, <laughs> you know, if you've got a 30 foot right of way and you've got 20 feet of pavement and only um, and a four foot sidewalk, you know, how do you get another sidewalk in there, you know, if you don't have the room for it? So that's a whole other discussion, but great question though. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we have time for one more. It's, 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 it's a statement as much of a question and it's just, uh, I guess, a good thing to leave with. And I apologize for everybody who's not able to get their questions answered. So parking lots all over the USA have become naturally occurring sites for folks lacking sufficient bandwidth in their residential neighborhoods. My son, an industrial engineer who has to lead virtual meetings, lives in rural Virginia, northeast of Richmond. If he only has to participate in a virtual meeting, he can drive several miles to the local grocery store parking lot and get decent enough reception. If, on the other hand, he has to host, lead the virtual meeting, he absolutely has to drive down to Richmond. So, and more of a, 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 a I guess, think a, a statement than a question, but um, I mean, there's something else with parking lots that I'm not even thinking about, and definitely related to the, the, you know, the bandwidth needed for the virtual work world we live in. If you have any responses, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think that gets back to a little bit of what I was talking about with, um, you know, infrastructure investment, and and should that just be left up to the private sector, or to, does does the public need to get involved? You know, does government need to get involved to make sure that there's this good bandwidth everywhere, whether it's landline or Wi-Fi or even, you know, with cellular data. Again, that's something that um, not necessarily planning commissioners, but board of appeals or, you know, sometimes we'll see or zoning board of appeals will see, um, you know, requests for new towers or new um, small cellular sites and things like that to try and improve um, not so much the coverage for voice these days, but really it's about the data and, you know, the internet basically. Um, and if that's how people are starting to get their their internet, I mean, it certainly is something that, you know, should be on the minds of everybody as we're looking at these approvals, you know. And, um, you know, if you sort of take that to the next step of thinking about, you know, architecture and things like that, you know, you could always talk about buildings, um, you know, should they be designed so that they can have some sort of additional uh, infrastructure on top to help support that sort of need for Wi-Fi, the need for cellular um uh, you know and then of course underground utilities obviously you'd always want to provide for a uh, space for the uh the landline kind of internet stuff so thank you well thank you kirk um very interesting um session topics a lot uh, a lot a lot of different ways this can go um and there's about a lot of opportunities as well uh again there's a lot of good questions came in and i will forge your way but uh, you've also saved your contact information so um, again, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay.